Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Sarah V. Hello, I'm Dr. Larry Eichenfield, and I'm a distinguished professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. And welcome to this program titled A 2020 Perspective on Barrier Repair and Skin Care in Pediatric and Primary Care. I am joined by superb internationally known faculty uh, in pediatrics and pediatric dermatology. First, Dr. Adelaide, or we call her Beta Eber. Thank you, Larry. I'm Adelaide Eber. I'm professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the UT Health McGovern Medical School in Houston and chief of pediatric dermatology at Children's Memorial Hospital in, Herm in Houston, Texas. And Larry Schachner. Thank you, Larry. Pleased to be here with you in Vita. I'm a chair emeritus and professor emeritus of dermatology at the University of Miami School of Medicine, and I direct pediatric dermatology there. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, so establishing skin care regimens for pediatric patients is clearly important in a healthy skin uh, barrier. Uh, but of course, when we're talking about pediatrics, we have this incredibly broad age, uh, ranging from infants who are, you know, having this transition from a, an aqueous environment to the air environment. And then we work our way up through school age to adolescents who have a different set of issues with their skin and, and, and essentially normal skin conditions such as acne. Um, so let's start off going to the beginning and looking at some aspects of, of newborn and infant skin. And particularly, we'll turn to Dr. Bear. Um, uh, Bita, what's your sense of the important aspects of some of the structural and functional immaturity of the skin and how this impacts on, on function in our very youngest uh, patients? Well, thank you, Larry. We know as we see the newborn or infant skin, it certainly is more delicate, um, more thin, but there are some actual properties that we look at very conscientiously as pediatric dermatologists. We know that it's both structurally and functionally less mature skin overall. We recognize also that there is an elevated skin surface pH, and we have to pay close attention to that. There is low lipid content. These children are very vulnerable um, to overwashing or certain ingredients and agents that might be applied to the skin. And unfortunately, this skin, because of the properties that I've mentioned, has low resistance to both chemicals as well as pathogens. This thin skin also allows for an increased epidermal water loss. So these children are prone to having more dry skin or just surface changes in the skin that allow greater permeability. All these things have to come into our construct of how we think about caring for the skin and offering a plan for the parents of this child so that they can properly care for the skin and, take, and make sure that the child uh, continues to, to do well and is comfortable and the skin is not irritated. Uh, Larry, any, any comments on how you translate this to practice recommendations on newborns and infants? Moisturization and appropriate bathing are, are really very, very important. We have this very small, heroic seven micrometers of stratum corneum covering our body. And the outside world has bacteria, antigens, irritants, even toxins trying to get through it and get to our immune system and, and or the baby's uh, otherwise health. So we really need to maximize the potential for the stratum corneum and the epidermis to be hydrated and to do its job. I think one of the things is that we know, we should talk about the vulnerability of infant skin. On the other hand, it's the term we use 
for the skin that we'd like to have as we age, right? <laughs> we want that baby skin and <laughs> the, the smoothness and the health of it is something that's important. And I've always been impressed with homeostasis. <laughs> How good a job skin does no matter what we throw at it. Though, of course, when it comes to our regimens, of bathing and washing and our moisturization. We, we want to bring best practices to it to leave the skin in as good shape as, as possible. Now, Larry, why don't we talk about as we get a little bit older and, and I know it takes some time for skin barrier to mature, but what's your sense of this from the ages as we get out of infancy and then move on a little older? Well, it, it, there's a lot of good news uh, as the child goes from a few months of life to three, four years of life. The stratum corneum is going to be 30, 35% thicker. The cells of the epidermis are going to be bonded together stronger, making it a, a better barrier. We see other things happening. There's increase in skin lipids. There's increase in what's called moisturizing factors. And there's a decrease in pH. All of those are going to make the skin more resistant to those bad guys I just mentioned before the bacteria trying to get in, the allergens that could get in and set off the immune system. We have a better skin barrier, thicker and more functional as we get a little older. And um, I guess, the do you standardly recommend a very different skincare regimen for a two-year-old than an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old? So we're, we're, we're dealing with, you know, very different uh, ages and needs. First, I think we have to be cognizant that 20, 25% of the kids we're seeing are atopic and they may have particular barrier needs and particular dysfunction going on for many, many years. So uh, I, I like to continue a really good moisturization program in my kids. Uh, having said that, as we start getting to uh, eight and nine in this country, a lot of the kids start to have the beginning of acne uh, lesions, and we have to be cognizant and also help our patients label read. So they're using non comedogenic products in the kids as they start their preteen years. Um, so I'm gonna move on to discuss skin barrier problems we have in, in, in pediatrics and some of the factors that relate to that. So um, as Larry pointed up, we have, you know, 20, 25% of individuals who probably have an atopic dermatitis tendency or atopic dermatitis or a dry skin tendency. And, and this is a population we identify um, when we can because we're going to bring to them a different standard recommendation. But we're aware that, that bathing and moisturizing can really influence the state of the skin. So if someone bathes a lot, and this is something we see across the ages, you know, we see in teens, for instance, with people who, you know, they, you take 30 minute showers two to three times a day with harsh soap, you can create an eczematous condition of follicular eczema. And, uh, and, and certainly we see um, um, overbathing sometimes in younger children as well, just helps to dry out the skin. On the other hand, we've shown that if you soak skin and then moisturize it afterwards, you actually don't dry out the skin. If you soak skin and don't moisturize it afterwards, that evaporation that happens leaves the skin a little bit, a little bit drier. So moisturizing can sort of be paired with bathing as a way to keep skin in good shape. And we're very conscious in our recommendations to, to families about the frequency of bathing, the avoidance of detergents and, and traditional soaps, which can really strip out some of the uh, natural oils and lipids and ceramides that are in the skin. Um, the use of moisturizer can certainly impact on, on minimizing dry skin, especially in those patients who have what we'll call fundamental dry skin or variations of ichthyosis. And in fact, we do realize that there's both, besides the environmental, before the environmental, there are some genetic tendencies that go along with dry skin. And we certainly learned about this in great detail with filament aggregating protein or filigrin, which genetically is expressed in the skin in variable quantities so that there are people who are deficient completely in this protein. And this protein helps the development of the skin, but also ends up as like these little mini sponges, these hygroscopic proteins that hold onto water in the skin. And yet a significant percentage of our patients have decreased 
evidence of that. So I, I often, as a teaching moment, show families about hyperlinearity of the, of the hyper thinner eminence. Sometimes we have to look around for someone who's smooth because so much of the population is heterozygote or have decreased filigree production. But if you show hyperlinearity as a sign of the inherent dry skin in that individual, it really helps to set the stage for interventions that can help to minimize the, the, uh, the dryness, which can also influence eczema. And there clearly are environmental influences um, so Dr. Schachner living in Miami has a little bit more humidity than we may have in parts of San Diego, which are really, which are really dry and different times of year bring different temperatures, both inside the house, <laughs> if we're putting on dry heat, which might uh, uh, further add to the, so the humidity compromise that skin has to deal with. Um, any input of uh, Dr. A. Bear or Schachner in terms of, um, approaches that you have for to skin barrier problems in children? One of the things I was going to mention, Larry, although it's not the main focus of our discussion, a lot of kids in the summer uh, go swimming. And that's that's another resource that can lead to uh, drying out of the skin, whether it's a chlorine-based pool or a saltwater pool. I generally get the kids to wash off and apply the moisturizer. And I like them to wash that pull water off right away. That's just one extra little vignette since we are having this discussion in the summer that I add to my educational regimen when I talk to parents because so many kids do swim a great deal in the summer, at least they do here in Houston. So, so Larry, earlier you uh, pointed out that everybody wants to have baby skin and, uh, and now we're talking about environmental influences as well. If we, if we look at our skin, probably the closest part we have to baby skin probably would be the skin on the buttocks, for example, as opposed to our hands and face. And why is that? Uh, because it's protected from the sun and it's protected from some other environmental influences. There is research to suggest that those kids who live in more polluted areas, closer to highways, closer to where there's a high sulfite kind of, uh, amount uh, in the air, uh, do have bigger problems in terms of barrier function and dermatitis. Why don't we move on to some aspects of the, the disease, uh, uh, diseases that we deal with, especially ones that are that are so common. So let's start off with a, a topic dermatitis. So, so Larry, let's go let's go back to you about your your perspectives on dry skin and barrier dysfunction in uh, atopic dermatitis and and how that how you. Um, um, how you bring that to both that population and patients who may be at risk for it. So, so we have this 20% plus of children who uh, have some degree of a atopy or atopic dermatitis, and they have decreased ceramides, they have increased transepidermal water loss, they have decreased hydration of their skin. But a lot of people don't realize that when we look at the atopic child, the problems aren't only lesional, they're really the, all the skin of the atopic patient. If we did studies of what looks like non-lesional skin, it too has decreased transepidermal water loss. It, it too has decreased stratum, it has increased transepidermal water loss, meaning it's losing more water and the stratum cornea is drier. So we have to really think about the entire patient as having barrier dysfunction and make sure we have moisturization uh, all over uh, our children with atopic dermatitis. And another point in terms of the moisturization and the care early on of our atopic patients, there are some who believe that the earlier and more severe the atopic dermatitis is, the more likely our kids are gonna go on the atopic march, which over the passage of time has more asthma, more food sensitivity, more rhinitis. So I think it's really important that we be cognizant of our atopic population and the need to really help where we can. And I believe moisturization is a big help in decreasing number of flares and frequency uh, of flares in these children. Oh, that's great. Abita, um, how about discussing children with sensitive skin? And let's include both those with particularly different skins, such as some of the either common or uncommon ichthyoses, or just children who, who are just um, respond to stuff you put on their skin differently? 
Well, I think sensitive skin, as you inferred, can mean different things in different patients. And we certainly see this in a broad spectrum in the cases that we care for. Our kids with atopic dermatitis, as Dr. Schachner mentioned, will be more sensitive to many components put on their skin. Almost anything put on their skin can sting and burn. But then we have patients with ichthyosis, particularly ichthyosis vulgaris, which 20% of the 20% who have atopic dermatitis will have or manifest and their skin can be more sensitive and their baseline won't be a normal baseline. They'll always have that dry, slightly fish scale look to their skin, in, particularly in certain anatomic regions. So those patients may need more humectants and keratolytics to help control their dry skin. Uh, then patients with flagrant deficiency can have varying degrees of atopic dermatitis. And we know that we can restore that barrier, especially if we use some of the agents available that contain ceramides. We restore and repair that barrier, a key component of the guidance that we provide as we talk to our patients and their parents about skin care regimens. Uh, we can also have children who are sensitive to items such as sunscreens or fragrances. That's a very common thing. We know some children with, with sensitive skin can even go on to develop allergic contact dermatitis or nickel dermatitis. We can actually do part of our education to help children not develop certain sensitivities. An example would be nickel sensitivity, uh, which be can become allergic contact dermatitis. is exceedingly common in children. When children, let's say, go to the mall and get their ears pierced, that's not an ideal situation. We can avoid that as much as possible by using nickel-free earrings and doing the ear piercing in our offices and providing proper guidance on that local skin care. But I think the spectrum of sensitive skin is broad. I think dermatologists are well prepared to give an overview and proper guidance in terms of the right products to use, the right regimen to use. And these are the discussions we really look forward to having with our patients on a daily basis. Thank you, Bina. That was great. I think I'm going to step up the age a little bit and talk about when, when, when you think about sensitive skin. I, I also think about once I'm dealing with my preteens and teens and regimens of care for acne, where sensitive skin can mean something even different in that group. But let's just start off that as we start to hit our preteen years, uh, the skin changes as the sebaceous glands get active and we have oilier skin and certainly a high prevalence of acne that develops uh, by mid-teen years with most, most of our uh, adolescents having some degree of acne. I think this influences standard skincare recommendations. You know, while acne is not from dirt, there's no question that, that occlusional acne is something that is an issue. And if you pair a, a, you know, a 14-year-old who doesn't like to bathe with a lot of oily skin and such. We have this scenario where like the moms are coming and saying, can't you just tell him to like wash his face twice a day? And to a degree, you know, yeah, if he did that, it probably would help it though acne's not, not from dirt. But then we get to much more sophisticated care regimens. But we do know that, the, it, that there are gonna be inherent differences in terms of how people do, not just with their acne, but with the medications that we use for acne. Our, our topical retinoids can cause dryness associated with them. Benzoyl peroxide is generally well tolerated, but some people get irritated, inflamed, or they have allergic contact dermatitis uh, 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 from it. Um, we have different topical antibiotics that are utilized that we get concerned about that because of antibiotic stewardship and creating uh, bacterial resistance. And then we truly have sensitive skin individuals who, you know, you could put on even the mildest topical retinoid three times a week and they, you know, they have a fine scaling that's appropriate that, to them um, and that you have to sort of work around with moisturizers so they can get in, uh, in good regimens. And I didn't want to end the area on acne without quickly discussing issues of, uh, um, that we faced with patients and skin of color, because we know the data shows that for acne, um, our teens and adults with skin of color hate post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation more than they do the actual pimples. <laughs> so uh, skincare regimens, there are very effective skincare regimens that can help to both prevent the uh, post-acne hyperpigmentation by managing the acne appropriately with either topicals up to systemic means, as well as topical regimens that can help to minimize hyperpigmentation. We also have skin of color issues in atopic dermatitis as well in terms of uh, uh, post-inflammatory conditions. And I think general good skin care, moisturization and minimizing inflammation in both of those disease states can help to minimize post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. 
Any comments from either of you on, on acne or skin of color? One of the things I'll mention is that many times patients will misinterpret the changes in the color of the skin, the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation as scarring. And so I think part of our education is to let them know it's not necessarily scarring that they're seeing, it's changes in the pigment due to inflammation. And we provide education and support to help them uh, deal with that and try to improve it. And we have a variety of ways that we can interface with the patients to help that happen. I, I, I agree entirely, Vita. And uh, Larry, I, I think there's so much one could discuss about skin of color and acne and atopic dermatitis. You pointed out some in acne. In atopic dermatitis, a lot of studies have shown that our African-American patients make many more visits to the pediatric dermatologist and the dermatologist and the Asians more than the African-Americans. So I think we have to be aware of the sensitivities and the differences between the races and how they feel and how they feel about the condition. I think it's really important. Uh, so many times with uh, eczema patients, they come in calling post-inflammatory hypopigmentation scarring. And I like to say, no, 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 it's not scarred. We're gonna get this normal. When we get the, the right mixture of anti-inflammatories and good skincare, this will normalize. And, and I think it's a, it's a very positive statement and helps to move them to uh, uh, really getting their skin under control. Well, let's move over um, to discuss some of the details because we've been talking in general terms about skin care, but let's get down to some of the, the uh, recommendations uh, that we make to our families about skin care products. And, and why don't we start off with, with, with infants um, and then we'll work our way to older children. So, um, Dita, how about cleansers? Uh, um, do you have any, any particular sort of standard approaches in terms of your counseling on, on infant skin? Well, there are two really key things that I want parents to hear. One is don't use a product that is uh, full of fragrance or um, items that can cause sensitization for the child, but fragrance I think is the number one thing. And believe me, there are a whole host of products on the shelves everything from lavender to vanilla flavor. These are things I would like parents to avoid. I also like to use soap-free products. Uh, babies usually don't have the opportunity to get that dirty. We do want, of course, our children to be clean uh, and cared for, but I think using a Syndet, which is a synthetic agent for cleansing the skin, we have a wide variety of these. They're available just in the regular grocery store or drugstore. They're not particularly expensive. But again, I caution the parent not to overbathe or to use harsh soaps. I do give specific names of products that I want them to avoid, but I do want them to avoid agents that have a lot of fragrance because I think that is an area where children can become sensitized. They may sell great, smell great, but if they're sensitized, we have another skin problem that we have to confront. And staying with infants, uh, Larry, you want to discuss your approach to moisturizers? So moisturize is a really, uh, it's an immense subject. Uh, and sometimes we use terms uh, like emollients and humectants and moisturize is usually a combination of uh, emollients, something that makes the skin softer and will improve the uh, water content. Uh, and those are oils and creams and lotions. And humectants, which Vita mentioned earlier, well, they help attract and uh, retain water within the skin. And they're made up of things like uh, glycerin, lactic acid, uh, hyaluronic uh, acid, uh, lactic acid, urea, et cetera. So moisturizers are a combination. Those moisturizers that contain ceramides, I think, have an extra group of benefits. Uh, ceramides are essential lipids that are part of the normal envelope of the stratum corneum top layer of skin and the cornea sites that cells in it. And a lot of disorders we discuss, the dryness, the ichthyosis, the atopy, ceramides are depleted. Ceramide containing moisturizers bring the lipid to the surface and not only act as, as a physiological aid to the skin, but also give the skin a little bit of an opportunity to start making its own natural lipids. So the, I believe there's a lot of benefits and there are, and perhaps we'll talk about it briefly, some studies that have shown uh, the ceramide containing moisturizers having a special degree of benefit. And the other key components, the humectants we talked about, also having uh, 
uh, an important role and important choices. One last thing I'd like to say quickly is that moisturizers have a little bit of the uh, law of real estate in them. Location, location, location. Uh, if I'm in the north and it's the winter, I'm going to use a heavier moisturizer, something with a heavier ointment. If I'm in South Florida and I want to moisturize, I'm going to go lighter with a lotion uh, or a cream. Uh, and on the human body real estate, if I'm going to do something and somebody's here uh, in, in hair bearing areas, they're not going to appreciate an ointment unless they want to look like Elvis. They're going to want something lighter. On the other hand, the ichthyotic dry skin of the feet and legs where ichthyosis shows up much more, sure, I'll break out something a little thicker and ointment like. I think that's great. You know, in the atopic der dermatitis world, we've, you know, we now have a more unified perspective on inflammation and barrier dysfunction. That an open skin barrier fuels inflammation, um, and that inflammation fuels a bad barrier. And we know we can help the skin barrier with anti-inflammatories, even if they're systemic anti-inflammatories, like we do with some of our biologic agents. But also good quality moisturizers can be anti-inflammatory, which we know because it's the mainstay of mild atopic dermatitis, which can sometimes correct with good quality moisturizers. Although, of course, we never say this as experts without saying, but if we have inflammation that doesn't respond to moisturizers, we need to go to the next step of having good anti-inflammatory control. But then the moisturizers become part of very important maintenance therapy. No, Larry, work that uh, you've published on and others have published on show that good moisturization will uh, decrease the use of steroids in atopic patients, will uh, decrease the itch, will in their own approve things like spore rads and easy scores, ways that we clinically evaluate the severity of atopic dermatitis. So I agree entirely with you. Uh, it's, it's an essential component. I was going to add one thing. I think that ceramide containing moisturizers also decrease the number of flares and, and increase the time between flares. And that's been demonstrated. Also, when I see many parents, they want to take away the one thing or the 26 things that is causing their child's eczema, their intent on finding that agent and removing it so the child's eczema will get better. But here, what I do is turn the conversation around and talk about what their skin is the child's skin is deficient in the ceramides and they have the ability to put something back rather than taking something away they're adding to the child's um, increased barrier function and i think that discussion is also beneficial because parents want that sense of control and i think it helps when you have a, an agent that you know will actually help them gain control in a better fashion if they apply it two to three times a day to the effective barrier in the atopic child I didn't want to leave the discussion if this is, you know, we're doing a 2020 perspective on both barrier pair and skin care. And part of skin care is going to be protection from the sun. And um, um, so, um, and that's across the ages. But, you know, I've been pretty consistent over the past decade and a half of talking about sun protection, not just as sunscreens. And it always gets put in a list of things that we can do. So you, know, you can avoid sun by not being in the sun. <laughs> and then clothing, which is highly effective and doesn't have to be reapplied except when you change it. <laughs> uh, and, and most clothing has pretty good SPF factor. And then I go through shade time of day, but then immediately then discuss with my families that However, you're going to be exposed beyond that, then then we have, you know, we have uh, um, sunscreens that can uh, effectively block the sun. And I think we've, we've taken a more practical approach over time as we've learned that that depending upon someone's skin type and degree of exposure, they're going to need different levels of sun protection to try to minimize both photo aging and wrinkling and skin cancer. Um, um, there's always activity in the field of uh, sunscreens in terms of, of issues that we're dealing with. Uh, certainly, I think when it comes to younger children and, and infants, there's been more of a push for the use of the physical based screen, uh, screen uh, creams and uh, oceans and uh, lotions and uh, ointments um, um, because of uh, concerns about some of the chemical elements that are in them um, and, um, and also different concerns about environmental impacts of some of the sunscreens that has made it harder for us to sort of give uh, mess uh, messages. But I do think that most experts are, 
or moving towards the physical based sunscreens in the younger age as I as I get to my my preteens and teens. It's more like an adult where I think there's a, a trade off. I need to come up with a, a, a regimen for sunscreens that will protect the skin. And if someone's not going to use something because they don't like the feel of it on them, uh, I'm willing to make the trade off for uh, different uh, types of products. And there are many different constituents. There are creams, there are gels that rub in rather dry uh, or so called sport sunscreens. Um, there are thicker lotions. And I, I think that there is a broad set of products that are out there that can be really, really uh, helpful. I'm not wedded to one company or one set of products, um, but I, I, I sort of keep an eye on an every few month basis of what what if issues are coming forward with our our sunscreens so we can give recommendations that are that are give some effective uh, sun protection, but also safe. Any um, any particular comments on sun protection or pearls of advice that you give? Um, one thing I'll say about atopic children, they may or may not tolerate some of the chemical sunscreens as well. So there I do make a specific recommendation about a physical sunscreen. I think they seem to be better tolerated. I agree with the use of hats, sunglasses, and, and physical protection from clothing. They are There are a number of companies that provide uh, catalogs or online resources to purchase these items, and they really can be an asset. Uh, they are more successful in some kids who are not really good about wearing the sunscreen. They will protect the children very effectively, and the adults too. Thank you, Bita. Before we finish up the section on over-the-counter skincare products, uh, two things. One is, is there any particular clinical evidence that you want to throw out there that's influenced the uh, uh, influence your thoughts on supporting the use of the products and are there things that you want patients and parents to avoid so i might start with that first question uh in there are some recent uh studies uh dan before one published in the journal of the american academy of dermatology a supplement and uh, charles lind in cutis looking at ceramide cleanses and moisturizes in atopic dermatitis and really showed exactly uh, uh, some of the things that Vita and I mentioned previously in terms of decreasing uh, itch, improving scores, decreasing flares, et cetera. So there is some good clinical testing that has been done that support the use uh, of the ceramide containing moisturizers. Uh, that's great. And I think I'll end to talking about some things that we'd like patients to avoid. Uh, uh, Bita has already pointed out that that fragrance can be an issue, especially in sensitive skin individuals. Um, uh, well, I'm not against naturals. I'm a little concerned about things that are marketed as naturals and or organic, because some of those can actually be sensitizers and can set up people for contact allergy that's been seen around the world with a certain product. So, so people have to read the, the labels, understand that there's uh, many of the mainstream products are mainstream because they made them bland <laughs> and purposely have a, a constituents in them that not only help the skin, but also don't sensitize the skin. So we're really pleased today to bring in a different perspective to this discussion about skin care and skin barrier, and that's to have a parent with us. And uh, Renata, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and so while the experts we have, uh, our pediatric dermatologists deal with the questions you know, at a regular standpoint of caring for skin at different ages. I think it's really different for a parent, especially a new parent. So let me start off the discussion with when, when you were a first time parent and you took your baby home, how did you care for your child's skin? So initially at the hospital, they did let me know like to not overbathe um, the baby, use a wet cloth. Um, and to kind of, because of the umbilical cord being still attached, I was like needing to be super careful. The skin is super sensitive, but to go around creases and whatnot with like a white wet cloth. And then who told you how to take care of your skin? What influenced you in those first few weeks at home? Was it, was it a doctor? Was it a nurse? Was it a, a parent uh, your, or one of your parents? Or was it a friend? Was it the internet? Uh, how did you get your information? So let's start with like, as soon as you have a baby, everyone has a lot to say, right? <laughs> From doctor, nurses, family, friends. Um, I did, you know, probably call the doctor a lot, my, my, my child's pediatrician. Um, and I depended a lot on the internet. I'm not going to lie. Social media, uh, different kinds of, uh, 
um, you know, just sites, just going through Google, almost like needing to um, just look up things like what are the best ways to take care of your, your child's skin. Um, my daughter, for example, my first child, uh, she suffered a lot with uh, um, diaper rashes. And I just felt like no one was giving me a solid answer. Nobody really knew her skin. I was just doing a whole bunch of research and asking various people like, what do I do? You know, like, how do I get rid of that? And is she going to have that forever? That was like a main thing. Renat, Renat, I have a, a question for you. Yeah, yeah. You had a prenatal visit with your pediatrician to um, receive some anticipatory guidance on how you're going to be caring for your newborn? No, actually I didn't. Um, even like with like our first time going in, I did not feel like I got like the 411 on how to take care of a baby's skin just yet. So I, I think that's really important. I, I think our pediatric colleagues, when they have prenatal visits, which a lot of them do, uh, I think they should be providing some anticipatory guidance to meet some of the questions that you had as you were leaving that you had to turn to internet and et cetera for. So right. it's just a thought for our pediatric colleagues, including skin, uh, which is very important to the new parent. Right. Larry, I agree with that. I, I know that I mean, families, sometimes they get guided by neonatal nurses as, on, on, their, on their way out, or there are some hospitals that actually have nice little you know, pamphlets with a broad set of ways to care for skin is one of the things that they deal with. But in other cases, they don't have that at all. So I think, you, you know, anticipating these issues and, and prenatal visits can be can be really helpful. And I think as providers, as pediatric providers, we wonder how prescriptive to be, right? You know, we don't just want to give, here's the, the moisturizer I like to use. <laughs> you know, there's sort of a, a broad approach to it. Um, but I guess that's a question, Renat, is um, did, you, did, you, did you change what you did over time, uh, both in terms of like normal skin care, and then you already mentioned you had a diaper dermatitis, were these experiences that you had with normal rashes or abnormal rashes, something that changed your, how you handled your child's skin? Um, so I actually initially like the biggest diaper rash problem. I was actually away. I was in Mexico and my daughter suffered from like a major diaper rash and I didn't know what to like put on. It was my first experience. And so we went out to like one of those little stores in the resort and bought her like an ointment from there. And uh, it actually made it worse. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's over the counter and made it worse. Called my doctor. And he's like, don't put anything on it until you come back. And then when you come back, I'll prescribe something for you. Yeah, I would say as the other mom on the call, on the, the program today, I know that diaper rashes can come up just after a nap. They can go to bed fine and wake up and have terrible eruptions. Um, I was also wondering um, when you got guidance from others, was that helpful or how, where did you get your best information? I guess is the bottom line question. So I... <laughs> you know mom was like don't put anything on there just like air dry <laughs> pretty much uh I know you had this as a child like your brothers also had it like don't worry like it'll you know it'll go away it's the humidity so I guess both parents family and doctor Renat so you um as your uh children age did you um I think one of them had eczema at some point and did they have dry skin preceding it or just tell us about that and how you handle it? So my son actually had terrible eczema. He was maybe about a month or two even. Um, it was like patches and whatnot. Um, I did a lot of like oatmeal baths that I was like looking <laughs> at, like through like, you know, social media, I've seen that um, or through like just the internet. And um, doctor suggested to like start, you know, he, he asked like, what are some of the things that I'm using on the baby? Like uh, what kind of creams or, um, you know, body wash and told me to start like just removing these things, use something that's more like eczema related um, products that are over the counter. And um, that's exactly what I did. And I was doing a lot of moisturizing after like bath time. I just felt like. Well, that, I mean, as we've discussed, uh, you know, dry skin is something that we see in lots of infants and children, and it's very much part of, of eczema. Uh, and um, so general skin care is important in those without eczema, but with eczema, you just, there's like added work to do because of uh, inherent. Uh, Thank God. I mean, as he got older, it, it got better, you know, like he, you know, it was less of that. I mean, we still went with like after bath time, you're still getting some kind of moisturizing, you know, moisturizing. 
And your so skincare regimens obviously changed with age. Yes, of course. Um, I felt like their skin is less sensitive as they got older. Um, I was able to kind of understand how to handle their skin. And at any time I was starting to see like a flare up or um, I was able to control it before it got worse. When you were going through these changes in, in skincare, was your, was your pediatrician a resource or were you just finding out information from non-professionals? So give us some sense of that. I did both. Uh, my pediatrician was definitely helpful when it came to, especially my son's eczema. He saw the concern that I had. Um, my son was, all, you know, very irritated with his skin. Um, anytime, you know, he was like trying to itch and as a baby, he was like, they're always annoyed. Um, but yeah, so my, my pediatrician did, you know, help with that along with like me just being a mom and just like <laughs> looking for answers all the time, you know? So I think it kind of, you know, they both are in aid of that. So what information do you think parents need to effectively care for their children's skin? I think that there should be a prenatal like visit where we are discussing like, you know, skin sensitivity and skin care and whatnot. Um, I also feel like that should, I feel like a, um, a dermatologist, like a, a pediatrician dermatologist visit early on should be something that we should do as parents. I feel like that should be recommended like during, you know, with like the checkups, I just feel like we start to experience things and we don't really know what how to react until it gets bad. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I ask you uh, about your son, his eczema, was it severe enough? So kept him up at night, the sleep oh, disturbance yeah. kept you up. So uh, I think something that's very important uh, for the pediatric colleagues to be aware of is that atopic eczema can be a disease of the whole family. Mom loses sleep, dad loses sleep, the other children at home may lose sleep and may lose a little bit of parental attention because atopic kids can take a lot of care. You know, I would send him, I would go to work, send him to daycare and they'd call me and be like, he's so irritated. Like there's, you know, and I have to leave work and I knew it was his skin. Like yeah. I felt really bad because I almost felt like helpless, like a little baby. I don't think he gets the idea that he has to like, you know, he felt like he needed to scratch, but he didn't know how. Um, and then when he did, maybe he scratched too much and it maybe was like becoming like, it was probably like bleeding a little bit. I feel like, yeah, it does, it does have an effect, you know, on, you know, the whole family, maybe even him just being cranky all the time and whatnot. And Renata, I was going to ask too, I know you talked about people making recommendations of what to use. Did you receive any recommendations of what to avoid or what not to do? We haven't talked about that. Um, yeah, a lot of the time they said, you know, if your child's skin is super dry, you should stop, you should like, maybe you're overbathing him. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you need like warmer temperatures in the house. I mean, not warmer, like do not put the heat up high during the, the winter time. Like I was getting advice like that. Um, not necessarily, or maybe stop using pro like specific products. They, you know, friends, family always said, you know, use homeo homeopathic like remedies, like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> put some milk on the skin, it's going to heal up or, you know, um, th that's what I was getting. Uh, thank you. I think what you really showed is that in the life as a parent with your children, you're learning and you end up becoming an expert on how to take care of your child's skin. But of course, we in the healthcare field want to make sure that we're, we're feeding the right information and can help you to make the determinations of the best way to take care for your children. And thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So in, in conclusion, we've seen that across the spectrum of age in pediatrics, we have variable states of what the skin barrier is, and with that, changing needs in terms of what we need to do to help to keep the skin in good shape. I think establishing a good skincare regimens for your infant and for your children as they grow older is very important for skin barrier health and to allow the skin to do what it is to do well. So I thank you all for this great discussion. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Renat, our parent contributor, um, Larry Shackner, Peter A. Beer, really uh, great leaders in the field. And I thank all of you for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions and follow the complete evaluation.